I always wonder why people clap before you do anything. <laughs> you know, I guess they sort of like, well, maybe if I clap now, I can leave. Um, I want to thank you for coming back. Hope you all had a nice lunch and are feeling good. You all, everybody feeling okay? Good, good. Um, before I get to the, uh, the presentation, I just want to stop again and see if there are any questions or comments or thoughts or donations. Mm. <laughs> Nothing? Well, if you come up with, yeah, go ahead, please. Actually, I do have a question. We were Good. discussing this when we went back afterwards. The comment that you made about taking students for coffee. Yeah. I'm thinking that there may, and someone in here probably knows, <laughs> policies against, like, if you just say, let's meet students at Starbucks this weekend. Are you, you allowed to do that? They can't ride in your car. You so, so you can meet car. places, you just can't, I know you can't transport, but you can always meet. I don't think they like you to single out, uh, from what I've heard, you don't like, they don't want you to single out, you can ask a group for the whole class, the whole class or you can okay. take them groups at a time, but I don't think they like you to single out one, because sure. it looks like I think, I think the whole thing is like a big gray, one of those, you know, gray area things. Mm -hmm. So. You want to avoid any appearances of impropriety, so you want to do like that. You know, mm -hmm. but the bottom line is this: is that you know, you're a human being on this planet, and they're a human being on this planet, and we live in a free country, and so <laughs> really there aren't a whole lot of restrictions. But if there is a you know the thing about riding in your car. Yeah, if it's an official function, then there's a liability issue with you transporting them, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have a student who needs a ride somewhere, you can give them a ride. I don't think that would be an adult. I don't think so. I don't think you can. You can't you take them. Because we used to be able to take them home. I take students home from school, but no, you can't do that anymore. Really? Liability because you're still a employee of the college. Yeah. But we may need to hear that straight from HR. Yeah, because come on. I mean, you see one of your students broken down beside of the road, you can't stop and help them? Help, yes, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so raining. I don't know. I'd have to get that. We need a Starbucks on campus. That's yeah. what you said. Well, exactly. you know, Janice had the most amazing idea. She said that we need a coffee shop on campus, but instead of Starbucks, we should name it Starbucks. Is there no one up, nowhere on campus we can get a cup of coffee? Yes. yes. Mr. Oh, yeah. Seeds? Mr. Yeah. Seeds. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was talking about was not necessarily transporting or not transporting a student, but doing it right here on campus. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, where you've got uh, the connection to the school. Because I can see where, you know, if you meet students off campus, it could look like a little bit of impropriety or favoritism or trying to be helpful. Which and there's the kiosk right down the hall, too. Right. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. And if the college <laughs> invested in a mentoring program, then I think that changes quite a bit because this becomes your mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, as for uh, transporting them or not transporting them, uh, that's something the college has to decide on. But I can see where the, you know, putting on my ex-president's hat, I can see where the liability comes. Uh, as to the side of the road, that gets a little bit questionable because you're not transporting, you know, as a college professor, but you're transport you're just giving a ride to someone. So you'd have to see what your legal has to say, and uh, that will cost you about a couple thousand dollars. To <laughs> yeah, but I think that I think they, I think the question's been asked and answered. I think I remember that it's not advisable. No, it's certainly not advisable. Yeah. Okay, anything really else? That cup of coffee. No, no, not <laughs> Nothing else? All right, as I go along, feel free to jump in. All right, I want this to be an open, relaxed session. And where I'm going to start um, could get a little bit, um, yes? Um, on that thing about, uh, I don't know if you meant locking, but I think you did say locking the door, not letting them in later. No, I didn't say locking. You didn't? No. How do you keep them out? But I, I don't, are we allowed to do that? At the school, anybody? Same question. Well, what did you say? Tell us that. First. What I said was, if a student is late to a class, you know, your rule should be in the syllabus to begin with, you know, indicating that you are not allowed to come in late, 
So if a student were to try to come in late to the first student to do that, I would say stop that student and say, sorry, you're late, don't come in. Uh, locking the door, no, that's not a good idea because that puts you into a, uh, a liability situation if something happens in the classroom and you all have to get out quickly like there was a sudden they brainstorm. Our, our doors unlock, are, are not locked from the inside. Only. You don't need a key to open oh. from the inside. Okay, good. good. I, uh, I, had, uh, I asked my students if they're late, they have to, they have to ask permission to come yeah. to class. And, but I had one student, he kept coming, he was chronically late, so I would, I would, he would ask, I'd say, come back in 20 minutes. Hmm. You know, and I'd, I'd he's just sitting outside yeah. in the hallway for 20 minutes, you know, but, but it stopped, you know, because it was, right. you know, it was, it was such a waste of time for him. You know, when you do it publicly to one student, they all get the message. You know, and it's a matter of, not only is it a matter of, um, appropriate service, it's a matter of respect to the class and the faculty member. You know, it's when a faculty member comes, when a student comes in late, it's like saying, well, what you say in the beginning doesn't matter much to me. And that's wrong, because what you say in that classroom has got to be important. And it's got to be so important that constant attendance is called for and required, as it says in the slide. I am a strong believer, and the studies show, that there is a direct correlation between attendance and success. Because if a student just sits in a class and absorbs a little bit, he or she generally absorbs enough to at least pass the course. Um, but attendance is absolutely primary. When we start letting students not attend, what we do is we create a habit that says this is not important. All right, this is not uh, something I have to do. Um, and obviously if the faculty member says, I don't have to show up, he or she doesn't think it's that important either. And that's a horrible statement to make. I've always wondered, and I don't believe this happens here, but in a lot of schools, faculty have a rule that says you don't have to come to class, but you've got to take all the tests and do all the homework assignments. That's like saying I have absolutely nothing to offer you in class. You know, my question is, so why bother putting that person in the classroom? Okay. Just have students come for an hour and read the book. Um, so attendance is important in, in many ways. And in terms comes to retention, um, requiring them to attend, uh, as you do, but don't, uh, is very important. It would be the same thing, you know, in, in the classroom okay. saying to, us, to students, you don't have to attend, you can miss X number of classes. Well. If your son or daughter were going to college and called you up and said, hey, I, uh, faculty member said I can miss four classes, so I'm going to, what would you say? Great, wonderful, waste my money. You would say, go to that class. You can't learn if you don't go to that class. But we say to other people's students, other people's kids, well, it's okay. But I guess when is the... When is it the person's responsibility themselves to decide that it's a valuable experience and to show up and that you're going to be more successful if you attend class? And having things, I guess I'm a liberal, um, having things mandatory to me says um, I'm forced to go. I, I may not learn anything, I may not get anything out of it, but. Having the mandatory word um, is, to me, a, you know, a turnoff. Okay, it may be a turnoff, but let me ask you a very simple, basic question. If we are there to teach students about a subject, as well as life, as well as prepare them to get a job and keep a job, we might as well start doing it in the classroom. And if you think about this required thing, um, you're required to be here, so why shouldn't your students be required to be here? Now, you don't have the luxury of you know, just not showing up in a class three or four times, or twice or once. If you don't show up, everybody wants, well, first of all, if you don't show up, let's be honest, students celebrate. <laughs> I mean, this is the only business in which the customer wants to be cheated. <laughs> 
you know, it's like, uh, oh, I'm sorry to say Professor X can't come today. Yes! Not if you have non-credit students. No, that's true. That's very yeah. true. If you have non-credit students uh, and you're not teaching a, uh, you're teaching a non-required course that actually fits into their goals in life, they will say they're getting cheated and they get ticked off. Mm -hmm. They will complain. They will complain. Yeah. She's the director of our older adult program. We ah. get very upset if class is canceled for any reason. Right. Well, they, and they begin with, I drove over here tonight. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's the same thing we would do. If you, how many would go to a movie theater, pay the money, sit down, and then have the manager come out and say, I'm sorry to say tonight the movie didn't show up. <laughs> Thank you very much for keeping your money. Excuse me? No way. No way. Now, I'm not saying be a fascist about it. You know, there are times when students can't make it to class. But they owe you the courtesy, whenever possible, of letting you know that in advance. In advance. Calling up and saying, I can't make it to class today. Uh, my babysitter is, is sick, and I have to stay home with my child. Well, very few faculty, I hope, would say, well, I guess you're going to get an F in the course because you missed a class. No. I can't come to class today because I'm in the hospital. Well, that's your poor luck, isn't it? No. There are excused absences, and that is a decision made by the faculty member and the student. You know, you can, you can determine, I know there's certain diet, um, um, dictates of what an excuse absence is um, in the school and throughout the state. I think there's a state rule on that. I think it's federal. Who? Federal. Federal. I mean, you know, there's a, it, because it gets into the uh, uh, discrimination based on the seven classes. And oh, interesting. Religious, <clears throat> religious holidays and things of that nature. Oh, interesting. I never knew it was a federal problem. Um, but that's something you can do between yourself and the, and the student. And the student. But, atten but attendance, well, let me show you a slide. Keeping attendance each day in most schools, I don't know what it is at this school, this is a study we did and we came up with 7 to 14 percent of enrollment can be increased by calling attendance because students know that you care enough to wonder if they're there and you demand enough that they be there and they get the message pretty quickly they get the message right away I, I don't well, see I don't it as like a black and white thing no because you know you're saying well uh, you said something about, well, I guess I'm a liberal because I want, you know. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's have a situation where we say, all right, these classes are valuable, and if you show up, you're going to learn something, and that's something you need to learn. So I'm not going to enforce attendance. Okay, so you look at the other end of the spectrum, you call it conservative, where you're, uh, you must attend. If you miss a single class, if you're late a single time, I will drop you from the class. You know, there's a. Right. What do you, I, in my opinion, what you want to do is get the students to understand that it is a valuable experience, but that also I have this expectation that you will attend. I mean, I want to teach you something. I got like a series of lessons, and, and if you skip lesson three and then show up for lesson four, you're not going to get lesson four because you missed the prerequisite stuff from lesson three. So these are all valuable experiences. It's not a smorgasbord where, you know, you can pick between the salami and the cheese and like that. It's, you know, it's a bunch of valuable information, and when you don't show up, that sends me the message that you don't agree with that. that you don't, you, don't, you don't have that same uh, opinion that it is a valuable thing. And so you kind of get them to go along by uh, peer pressure or whatever. Well, you do, and, and what you can do is the same thing they do in business. Because, again, this is preparing students for employment as well as the knowledge 
that we're giving you. And in business, what will happen is the boss will generally say, okay, I'm going to let it slide this time, but if this happens again without you notifying me in advance, don't show up. Don't show up. And I think that's fair. That's fair. I mean, everybody has days when they just can't do it. Um, but you don't want too many of those days. You don't want two of them. Well, your policy states, hmm, I'm going to have to talk to someone when I get back. Your policy states that uh, attendance is uh, required. required. Thank you. But then it goes on to basically say afterwards, as, as Herman mentioned earlier in the earlier session, that the faculty member will decide how they want to determine what required means. So that's not a policy. That's not a policy. My recommendation is that your policy should say that attendance is required. However, we do understand that there are times when an excused absence may be necessary upon the agreement of the faculty member. That puts it still square in your hands. If you are a faculty member, and I hope you don't do this, who believes that if you don't show up and take the test and pass them, that's fine, you're still within the regulation. You're still within the policy by that wording. But it makes the point. Now, keep in mind, the students never read this policy. So what you need to do in every one of your classes at the beginning, at least in the beginning, is keep it in the syllabus, state it clearly, and tell people what your expectations are. And if they're going to be different than, you know, you have to attend. If you, some people might say you can miss two classes. I don't recommend that. You're increasing the student's possibility of dropping out and missing two classes by about 13%. Because what happens if you miss a class, as Herman was talking about, you miss module four, and I'm on five, and you need four to do five. You show up, you miss four, you come up for five, and I'm confused. I don't understand any of this. And you know what? I just don't know this stuff. I can't do it. I won't do it. The hell with it. And they drop out. They drop out. If you chart, if you charted um, attendance and then dropouts, you would see a direct correlation. Absolute direct correlation. And our goal is to have everyone complete your class because your class is the most important class a student is going to take at this school. You've got to believe that. If you don't believe it, you're doing the wrong thing. Your class is the most important class a student is taking at this school. Because if you take this one, it's going to integrate with this and this and this and this. Even if it doesn't, you've got to believe it. You had a question or a comment. Well, I I was going to say, I have a, in my syllabus it says, in response to a third absence, I can drop them, fail them, or give them whatever grade I feel like. <laughs> and, and they know that. I mean, and so oftentimes they know, like, I'll have students that will, and they'll have three absences, and I'll take them outside. I said, you know what this means, right? This means I can give you whatever grade I and so then the onus switches to them, and oftentimes they become great students after that. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to do everything perfectly, they're going to be much more conscientious, right. do extra homework and research and so on. Unfortunately, you missed almost 10% of your class by doing that. You know, it depends what you teach, too. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I would ask anybody, and I'm not picking on you at all to decide what 10% in your subject is, is unimportant enough to drop out of the, the, uh, uh, the teaching. Yeah, you know, because the, that three classes is about nine well, point something and percent. It's still, uh, and, it's, and, and it's still they have to find out what they missed and... But now the answer to all of this, the answer to all of this is to be such a dynamic, <laughs> interesting, informative teacher that your students want to come to your class. All right? That's on you. That's on you. Um, and you have evaluations, and you should be able to read those evaluations and learn from them. And if the students feel that you are not that exciting, learn how to get more exciting. 
I mean, you can, le you can learn to do <coughs> some of that. The professional development can help you do that. But the whole question disappears when a faculty, a student, respects the faculty member, believes that he or she is really kind of interesting and exciting and teaches me something, and they feel as if they're getting a good return on their investment by going to that class. So we can skip the whole thing, can we? You had a comment or a question. Um, I guess, you know, our goal is to get um, students to eventually be successful in their job and life. And to me, it seems like you have to come internally, become aware of what is expected of you and what's beneficial for yourself, and having you know, rules that say you must do X doesn't ever let anybody internalize what's good for themselves and someone's just always telling them what to do. It's like if they want to learn stuff, you don't tell them the information. Okay. They discover the information or, you know, it's active learning it, and it's when we have, you know, uh, really strict policies, I, I, I don't think that's, it's all spelled out and it's, you know, all right. I, I don't find that useful. I, I do take attendance, I'm required. <laughs> that's good. Now, think about it this way. Um, all of parenting is teaching. And in parenting, we do lay down rules because we do know better. I have a rule for my grandson. He is never, ever allowed to run out into the street. I am not going to have him learn about the danger of doing that the wrong way. All right, so I have a rule about that. And as a parent, I had rules about a number of things. And that was because I wanted to shape the student. Sometimes letting them shape themselves I have two nephews who shape themselves. You know, both of them are um, of questionable value to society. A questionable shape? <laughs> no. You can determine what they are enough so you walk around them when you see them in the street. But none of this matters at all unless you do attendance properly. All right, so I want to talk about the way that attendance ought to be done. Whether you have three absences, and this is all your choice, finally. Three absences, a no absence, or one absence, or whatever. First thing is role needs to be taken. And if you take role the first few days, student, and then t have the seating chart afterwards, students get the idea that, role, that attendance is important. That tells them something right away. All right, the, the seating chart seems kind of hokey, but it works. But it works. So you take attendance. Any absence of a student needs to be reported immediately to someone at the school who is, res who is responsible for retention. Now, if you don't have someone responsible for retention, you need to get somebody. We have it. I'm sure you do. Early warning. We do. Huh? We have the early, 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 early warning system. Absence. Yes. Yeah, but as soon as they miss a class, you can report them. You should report them. That's one of the pull downs that I you didn't say you have to, but you report them. If they miss a single class, you can report them. In you fact, you should. Class. You should report them. Two things happen when you report them if they miss a class. One, <laughs> you let them know that you are watching. All right, and two, they learn that you care about them. You cared enough to send the very worst. You know, so you, you let them know. All right? Second time, positive phone call immediately. Um, what I mean by that is a call to the house and just to ask the, the student, you missed my class today, is there a problem? Are you not feeling well? It is amazing the impact of a simple phone call like that. Now, yes, there are FERPA rules, all right, so you don't talk to the parent, you talk to the kid. 
which is true of uh, email follow-up from retention. I recommend sending out postcards. And the reason you send out a postcard, and it just says, um, sorry to hear you missed you know, this class. Is there a problem that we you know, can help you with? Uh, please get in touch. Something as simple as that, a positive statement about it. Not, you missed a class, what the hell's going on here? But you do a postcard for two reasons. One, because people look at postcards nowadays, because you don't get many of them. Two, it is in keeping with FERPA um, if the parent looks at that, because you've directed it, it's breaking the postal laws, but. I don't think any postman's going to come to your door and arrest you. Um, the parents find out the student is missing a class, too. Now, there may be a very good reason. And if the student's missed a class for a good reason, the parent's just going to say, well, that's because you were sick. You know, I'm glad they, I am glad they got in touch with you. Please follow up and get in touch with the teacher to get the extra help. If they don't know you're missing classes, quite often they're going to say, what are you doing? whether they're an apparent or a spouse. There are many spice who have um, their other half in class, and they are often sacrificing and doing more to allow that person to stay in class, particularly in nursing. You know, nursing is one of the most difficult programs in a college on a family, because not only are you study constantly, you've got other obligations as well. And so someone's got to care for the kids, someone's got to make extra money to you know, bring into the house. So immediately the person says, what are you doing? You're not going to class? The person gets a message from home that they want you to go to class. That is a stronger force than you are. I go over this because attendance really is that important. You're losing a large part of your, your student population because they're not attending. You know, the, what is it, Woody Allen, 90% of it is showing up. Really is. It really is. Finally, um, second absence, a call, email, and a postcard. Those first three, by the way, it's one of the three. I'm, I didn't mention that. It's one of the three. The others, you get all of them. Call, email, and postcard. Third absence, in your case, I happen to use three absences because it is a very common um, uh, attendance policy for many faculty. The person should be getting a registered letter that says, you have missed three classes. What this means is that you can be dropped from the course, you can get an F, see me immediately. Now, I say registered just to make it, like, stand out. But you can send a radio letter saying that. And if they don't care, they're not going to do anything. Now, I mean, you might have lost that student already, which is a terrible, student is a terrible thing to lose. Not only because if you want to fulfill your mission, which is to educate students for a better future, um, you can't do it if they don't show up and you don't educate them. It's because you're losing revenue. Every student that drops out is taking his or her tuition with them. Then you've got to go out and replace that student and gain another student just to keep population level. So attendance is a real problem. If you can get your enrollment up, or your attendance up, your, re your retention up, uh, you will get your enrollment up because you won't have to keep replacing. All right, I think I've killed that topic enough. <laughs> Stay in touch, keep in touch. Um, that's a very important thing. Again, you can do that by in your classroom teaching, no matter what method you use, whether it be um, lecture, old style lecture, or active learning, or interactive learning, or however you do it. There are, many, there are a number of different ways that seem to be uh, working quite well for different classes in particular. Keep in touch with students. Simply out of the blue, just say to somebody, Herman, how's it going today? Am I, am I doing all right? Which is a question that blows the mind of students. Am I doing all right? Now, normally they'll say, yeah. But every so often you get a student to say, well, I'm not sure because I'm, I'm not following this. You're going too fast. Or something as simple as, I can't read your handwriting. 
all right? It's worth doing, just every so often, calling on somebody. Not with a question about the subject, but how, how we doing? You okay? You following this? It's amazing. Keep in touch, be in touch. Touch is the most important thing. And all the work that I have done in retention, I have found that the programs that are most successful have the highest level of touch. The highest person interaction. Program I can think of that comes to mind uh, right now is at uh, Ostos Community College in the Bronx, the South Bronx. Uh, your pictures of New York at its worst, that's the South Bronx. Uh, it really isn't as bad as the pictures we have. I've actually stayed in the South Bronx uh, while working with this school and had a wonderful time. Nice people. Of course, I stay out of certain areas because I'm not stupid. I take that back. Maybe I am. Um, they have a program where they take students who are developmental and every one of them is mentored. They have a faculty member or a coach. That's the job, coaching, assigned to them. And that person does nothing but following up with that person, <coughs> keeping in touch. The student is also required to report in once a week. And those students have like a 75% retention rate in an extremely destitute population. It works. Touch counts. And it doesn't have to be real. It can be psychic. It can be pedagogical. When you do re grading papers, a lot of people just go through it and make the marks. I remember um, people doing composition. They write wrong tense, wrong this, wrong that, wrong this, wrong that. You know, fix this, not a full sentence and give a grade at the end. You gotta make some kind of a touch as well in your grading. In math, English, any of them, at the end, bottom of the page you can just write a simple note. Math, seems to be you're getting this information better, but maybe we can help you do better. Someone getting a 60 or a C. On an A, this is great work, thanks. You know, I say thanks, because a student who does great is giving me a compliment. Because I'm responsible. Be in touch with the student. Every so often, as I've talked about during the morning, send out that little card. Just saying, just want to let you know I'm happy you're in my class. Particularly send that to someone who's been absent. That'll blow their mind. And often get them back into the classroom. Because they're often out of the classroom because they believe you don't give a damn about them. You're going so fast, I don't follow this stuff. You don't care about me. So it's a matter of getting them to know that you do care. High touch. Um, classroom decorum, another topic. Extremely important. Classroom decorum is a good customer service point. Because when you allow, and I talked about this this morning, didn't I? Well, I'll talk about it briefly. I think I'm having deja vu, and I think I talked about it. If you're in a class and you're allowing a student to interrupt, you're allowing a student to sleep, you're allowing a student to play computer games, all right, that is saying to you that I have disrespect for you. One. Two, it's saying to the class, I have disrespect for all of you. I have such disrespect that I can play games on my computer while you fools are listening to the, you know, to the faculty member. That's bad decorum. You don't have to put up with it. You do not have to put up with it. And if you're in a position and thinking, I wish I could just tell that student to get out or shut off the computer or whatever, the administration won't support me, you need to have a talk with the administration. Because they need to support you on this. Because if bad decorum in a classroom interrupts everybody's ability to learn. Because when you get that one student that you know is playing on the computer, all right? We have watched in classes, we watch the faculty member's eyes. They're constantly clicking over to that person playing on the computer, trying to think, how do I get that person to stop? The best way to do it is to tell them, stop. Put your computer away. 
but I'm using it for class. No, you're not. I don't know of any classroom notes that say kapow. Students who fall asleep in class, uh, they can't learn anything sleeping. If they're that sleepy, tell them to go home and get a bed rest. Or, even better, ask them why they fell asleep. Sometimes you find out they have a reason for being tired, but that's not an excuse, unfortunately. Because at work, they frown upon it when you take a nap during work. <laughs> Again, we are teaching students to be adults. We are teaching students to be good employees. And if we let them have bad behaviors now, they're going to think they can practice them later. They think they're going to practice them in the workplace. And that's not allowed. I would, it's amazing how shocked people are, young people, when the boss tells them, you are late today. This is your last chance. It's like, what? That guy is a, is, is a monster. No, that's just the way it is. But they have learned from us that it's optional. Not optional. That's why I said earlier that if a paper is due on Tuesday, it's due on Tuesday. And if they don't get in touch with you and give you the respect of letting you know that i got a problem in your agreement that they can be late, then that should not be allowed. Because again, in the, in the world outside of academia, you do not lose a letter grade each day the report is late to the boss. You lose a job. And that is a lot more than a letter grade. A lot more. Decorum is very important. Um, oh, that, is that clock correct? Yeah, you have 35 minutes. Oh, 35. Okay, good. This is an argument that I have used with administrators. Um, if, and this will work even if you have even a small amount of active learning stuff going on in your classroom. If Johnny here is busy doing anything, if he's sleeping, if he's texting, if he's doing anything, if he's not engaged, he can't participate in the active learning. So not only is he hurting himself, he's hurting the other people in the class who are depending on him. So like for example, I'll have I, I do lots of things, but you know, you stop and say, okay, check your neighbor on this, see what your neighbor thinks is the answer to this. So we stop for a minute, you check your neighbor, and if I'm sitting next to you, I got no neighbor to check because you're not engaged. So now, you know, that's the reason that I don't allow this behavior, because it's not only hurting him, it's hurting the other students in the class. So yep. that's why I don't allow it. So you have to be engaged and you have to pay attention, or you can't be there. Yeah, excuse me, it's a very good example. Very good example. Uh, but you need to put it in the syllabus. You need to put it all in the syllabus. The syllabus is a contract. I don't know if you know this. It's a legal contract between you and the student. So legally, if you violate the syllabus, a student could take you to court over it. <laughs> you did not require this paper. Therefore, I'm suing you to make me write it. I don't see that happening. But if you don't cover material that's in the syllabus, sooner or later someone is going to take one of somebody to court over it and want their money back. And want their money back. Um, we, have li we are living in a much more litigious world than we used to live in. And students believe they have rights. And students believe that you need to fulfill your obligations to them. The syllabus is a contract. Put it in the syllabus. Make it clear, for example, if you don't want people texting, texting is not allowed. Cell phones are not allowed out during the class. Now, what does that mean? Well, a student comes up to you and says, I need to leave my phone on uh, because my daughter is at the doctor's now and she's having tests and I have to be available to find out what the test said. Or whatever, something like that. You can always make an, ex an excuse for that person. Just tell the class in advance. I'm letting John leave his cell phone on today because he may have a, a phone call that's extremely important and he can't be missed. But John knows that if the call comes in, he gets up and leaves the class during the time of that call. All of these are not inflexible rules, please know. A lot of it's open to interpretation. You know, but these are guidelines that I think are um, 
uh, rather important. Important enough for you to put it in the syllabus. Once it's in there, the student shows up for class, you two have a contract, and he or she has to follow that contract as well. Otherwise, you have the right to let that student know he or she is no longer wanted in the classroom, particularly if it says in the syllabus. Students who talk on their cell phones will be asked to leave. Boom. That's it. Now, what you can do, if you're uncomfortable with some of this, you can negotiate the syllabus rules with the students. Take the first part of the first class to negotiate the rules. If that will make you feel better and make the students feel better, that they agree to them. Most of the time, you'll find students will agree because they're really ticked off when someone takes a phone call in class. They're feeling like, I'm paying for this? You know, if you scratch a student hard enough, they'll tell you they think about it in terms of how much I'm paying. They are customers, and they are much more oriented to seeing themselves as consumers than they are learners, than they are learners. So we have to keep that in mind. All right, rewards. How do we reward students? Not through grades. Not through grades. I'll give Johnny a B because he tried hard. He does not know squat, but he, he tried hard. To me, that's like saying it's not important to learn anything. I love effort myself, and I often used effort between a B plus and an A minus. That's where I think it came in. But to give someone a, a grade that they don't deserve because they tried, um, that's sort of like asking someone to uh, um, climb a rope, and if they only get halfway up there, say, well, you did it. It's like what we do in our society. Congratulations. Oh, God, this happened just the other day. Um, my son-in-law called me all excited because my granddaughter placed fourth in a golf tournament of eight kids. <laughs> and I thought, that was wonderful, but that's great that she did. All right, but the way he was singing her praise over that, it was as if she had won the USA Open. You know, and she was going to get a tur uh, everybody in that tournament got a trophy. And it's sort of like the, um, the insurance commercial. Jimmy's are for winners. I don't know if you have that commercial down here. Um, oh, in the commercial for, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's this woman who's in there all the time, Flo. Oh, yeah. yeah Progressive well, insurance. Yeah. And in this commercial... There's one guy who lost a sale because he told the customer that there was another company that was less expensive. And she told him, okay, you tried hard, you gave them the real information, you were honest with them, you were truthful with them, you lost it this time. Let's go get an ice cream cone to feel better. And he says, and Jimmy's? And she says, no, Jimmy's are for winners. <laughs> and A's are for winners. You know, I, I must sound like a real curmudgeon. I must sound like a monster. But what happens in my classes is, first of all, the kids have a great time, and they work, and they, most of them did get A's and B's because they wanted to get A's and B's. And to a large extent, they ended up having to get A's and B's because they showed up for class, and I actually covered the important material in class using the reading as uh, additional supplementary work, and we did most of the work right in class. And I taught composition, I graded not on what you got on the test, but what progress you made and finally getting to writing your last essay correctly. If you could write your last essay without, uh, I think it was two grammatical errors, you know, you were doing okay. And this was for kids who came in with developmental as well as so-called regular needs. I demanded and they fulfilled. Students have an innate desire to please you. They really do. They want to make you happy with them. Just like we do when we work with other people. We want to make them happy with us. Now, there are only a few people who work very hard to make other people miserable. They're called in-laws. 
<laughs> but they don't really. That's just the way they are. Um, there's a value in all rewards. So what, what kind of rewards? Thank you for your answer. Just a comment. These are just simple ways of letting people know. Often students will give you an answer to a question that's not correct. I've seen teachers who just go, no, no, that's wrong. And that student feels like homemade poop. <laughs> a better way of doing it is saying, well, that's a good answer. Not quite correct, but a good answer. Good try. It makes a person feel better. It encourages your students to, to say something in class. I've seen faculty members who wonder, why don't my students talk in class when I ask them questions? Because they're often scared of what the response will be. And it can be as simple as, no. That says to everybody else, I'm not going to take a chance of having my ego destroyed. Because you've been publicly um, lambasted. Not good. These are just different ways. Not quite correct, but thanks for offering it. Think of ways that work for you that say to students, you're doing a good job, even when you're wrong. A nice try, but not quite on target. That's a lot better than, have you even read the book? <laughs> those are the kind of rewards, those are the kind of service statements that students need to hear. And if they hear them, they will want to please you in the classroom. They will feel that you are a good person and you care about them. All right. Um, yeah, you can read that one yourself. I always hate it when PowerPoints are just read to people, as if that's the whole presentation. Any questions or comments about that? Again, that's the card home game. Those cards end up on the refrigerator, as I talked about earlier, and everyone likes it. Now, the other thing is, by the way, I forgot to mention, on these cards home, I'll mention it now, when a parent sees it, because the, the student or the parent or the spouse is going to show it, the student or the or spouse is going to show it to the parent or the other spouse. Um, and what's going to happen is the other spouse, the parent, is going to have a, a good opinion of you. It's going to feel they want to support you. So when the student comes back and says, I don't know about physics, I'm having trouble, uh, I think I'll drop it. I will often look at that card and say, well, uh, Mr. Trevellino wrote you that card, didn't he? Uh, yeah. Well, why don't you go see him? Maybe he'll help you out. They'll support you. When you send the attendance card home, by the way, they're not going to get angry at you. They're going to get upset at Junior for wasting their money. And they're going to support you and the school for caring about them. Remember that 27% of the reason why students drop out of a school is they believe you don't care. And that's because you're not providing, and I'm saying you, when I say you, I'm not talking about any one of you, I'm not talking about all of you, I'm talking about, you know, all of education, but I'm happy to pick on you for the moment because I'm here. Um, is pleasing the student with good service. All right, not pleasing the student, but pleasing with good service. So. Question on the uh, mentors and the frogs. Were those, uh, yeah. were those faculty members? Who mentored? Yeah. At some schools, it's faculty members. At other schools, we've gotten programs going where it's faculty and staff. Because of not mentoring them in, the, in a subject, it's mentoring them in, their, de in their, de their growth, their developmental growth. Just sitting down with them, talking with them, just sending a note home, just calling them up and saying, how you doing? To be honest, that mentoring approach is a, re is a retention approach. All right, it's meant to boost retention. But at the same time, it boosts learning because the student believes it's someone that he or she can go to when there's a problem. And you make yourself available if the student has a problem. My daughter would have dropped out of college, the first college she went to, if it weren't the, for the fact that she found a mentor. Um, because she was just finding it very hard to navigate that institution. Uh, she found a mentor in, in the person she worked for, 
she was working part-time in the bookstore. And the manager of the bookstore took her under her wing, and she had someone she could talk to in the institution who could help solve problems. Now, what the mentor also does is the student has a problem, you help figure out ways to solve the problem. Okay, I understand what the problem is. Now, I'm, I can't answer that, but you know who you see? You go see the bursa. They're the ones who deal with um, bills. Let me make a call for you and set up an appointment. Boom. Done. Great service. Does that help you out? Yeah. Good. All right. Were, they, were, the, oh. were the mentors like spread across the institution or were they like focused in admissions? No, spread across the institution. Your admissions department is not large enough to be mentoring the entire college, nor is your retention people large enough. Now, the retention people can do a heck of a job. We had one program we set up because they just didn't have the staff to do it, and to be honest about it, the faculty didn't want to do it. All right, they felt it was calling on them to do extra work beyond what they were supposed to be doing, and they felt that they were being stretched already. And I can't argue with that. They know their situation better than I do. Um, so the retention people, we set it up so we created a retention group, and they had to call 10, 10? No, 20 students a day. We had five people calling 20 students a day, 100 students a, uh, um, a day with all of them. So by the time the week went by, they called every student at least once a week. And if they didn't call them, they called them into the office. They didn't call them into the office. They sat down, had a cup of coffee with them at the school. And uh, our retention rose by 27%. And I think most schools would be very happy with a 27% retention increase. And I, 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 their retention rose at 27%, excuse me. And I think their retention rose primarily because of the retention effort. Again, because students felt that someone cared about them. There was someone to uh, make sure that they were attending classes. Faculty didn't want to do class attention either, but they were willing to report the students who didn't show up. They'd call the roll and report them that were missing, so they followed up with a phone call from retention. Um, and because um, it kept the student tied to the institution. It was high touch. High touch. Yes? Was it the same person calling tweak? What's that? Was it the same person calling? Yeah. What we did was we broke the enrollment down into five sections, and these were your advisees to the retention people. And we, we, we gold the retention people. We told them, we expect that you will have this percentage of retention in your group. And if they couldn't get it, they went for more training. And if they couldn't get it, they went for another job. Um, it was too important to the institution to have revenue coming in to keep the doors open. Yes? I'm just curious about how many people here have been involved in either being a mentor or having a mentor, even including things like at many colleges where I've worked, you're, you're an advisor. And so you have advising. So how many people? So not we've tried that here. Oh, I see. Them. We've tried it here a few times. We've had mentoring programs, and they don't ever seem to work. It seems like after you meet with the person, maybe two or three times. I don't know that they 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 end up not liking you for some reason. <laughs> It's just, I don't know what it is, it just doesn't seem to always, and I've noticed this, I don't know, it's just maybe it's the human thing, it's like if it's somebody you like, I guess, the process goes on. I mean, mentoring is a great thing, but mm -hmm. I don't know how you can make it work. Well, I think know? James, no, no, we're talking I think about. James Hellman said, true mentoring is a mutually beneficial mm -hmm. thing yeah. between the mentor and the mentee, and I think... I think the hurdle to get over is like when you're assigned to somebody. Yeah. Rather than those relationships that occur more spontaneously. Not to say that that still might not be valuable because a lot of the times the students who need the mentors the most are the ones that would have the most difficult time right. going out and finding one on their own. You're both absolutely correct. 
Part of the problem in a mentoring type program is that the mentors, one, don't get to choose their own mentees. Is that the word? Yeah. Mentees? It sounds like a mint. <laughs> so I was thinking about a large uh, yes. swimming. Exactly. It's going to be in the dictionary <laughs> next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but often that doesn't work. Part of the problem is mentoring is something you shouldn't be working at too hard. You should get together with the student a couple times to get to know each other, make a phone call, you know, every other week, just to let them know that you're there in case they have a problem, that you are the point of contact at the institution to help them out. And that can do enough um, to make them feel as if they are cared for. They are cared for. Now, if the student comes up with a bit of a problem or an issue and you're able to help them out with it, oh my goodness, you're God. Yes? I was just going to say, um, from a staff perspective, because I'm not a faculty, but you know, you, have, you can look for those opportunities because you know, it, we have work study students in our office, mm -hmm. and you do the same type thing with like what you're saying you do in the classroom with those work studies, and you will find that they will come to you then when they have a problem, and you're able to help them or point them in the right direction. So it's a matter of perspective on our part to be looking for those opportunities where we have interaction with students, even if we don't have a formal mm -hmm. mentoring program on campus. And that's important for all of us to do. Yeah, you know, what I would say is if you don't have a formal mentoring program on campus, I would ask that each of you try to find three students that you try to reach out to from the class, you know, and just stay in contact with them. Once the word gets out that you are available to students, you will find that more students will become available to you. Now, if you don't want students available to you, that's a different story. If you don't want students available to you, as I said earlier, you're in the wrong job. And you right. talked a lot about us learning the students' names. Well, I think it's equally important oh, for the students to learn each other's names. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're absolutely because correct. Because that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and Yep, and if I left that out, I'm sorry. I should have put it in. Thank you very much for, for mentioning that. I uh, want to move on just a little bit now. Um, this, you saw the earlier one. What do you think this one says? Yes. Listening and smile. Listen and smile. It also says, listen before you speak. We are doctors. We are physicians of the brain. Not neurologists, but physicians of the brain, trying to teach that brain to function differently, to gather more information and process more information. But like doctors, we jump in too quickly because we're also problem solvers. Do you know how long it takes for a doctor before he or she decides what you've got when they're talking to you? In other words, how long do they really listen to you to find out what your symptoms are? Anybody have an idea? 30 seconds, please. <laughs> 30 seconds would be good. 18 seconds. 18 seconds. Believe it or not, in those first 18 seconds, the doctor is analyzing you and trying to get you uh, put into a classification to follow up with. You ever notice when you stop talking, the doctor immediately goes, okay, how about this, this, this? 18 seconds, which is why if you don't talk about the right thing early, all right, you're going to end up getting the wrong thing. That's true. Getting the wrong thing. So I, I, I recommend when you talk to a doctor, tell them first of all your major problems. Don't build up to it. All right. Uh, you could end up with a colonoscopy when you need a, a cold pill. God forbid. Yeah. Well, we do some of the same thing. We do some of the same thing. I catch myself doing it, you know, quite often. Someone starts to talk, and I already start going, ah, I know what the response should be. And I haven't heard what they, you know, fully what they have to say. We've got to listen with both ears and let them talk. And what we should be doing is, when they finish talking, counting to three. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. And then summarizing what they said. Okay, let me make sure I understand what you said. What you said is, and then... See if you get that feedback. Yes, that's the problem. If the student says to you, uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about, then 
inquire as to what they're talking about. But too often we're too quick to try to provide a, ser a quick answer and a service to give them full service of listening to what the problem really is. And our students do not know how to present themselves very well much of the time. You know, they talk around the issue. They get nervous. They get very nervous. They get very nervous. You are a powerful person. I hope you know that. To students, you are powerful. Not only do you hold information, and not only do you have higher degrees, you get to give out the, the grade. And students are afraid to let you know, for example, that they don't understand something. Students will sit there in a class not understanding what you're talking about and wait to the test to prove it to you. That's not good. So what you've got to do is use your eyes, not just your ears, but your eyes to look for anybody who looks a little bit confused or even complacent. Sometimes people look complacent when they're confused because they don't want to look confused or a little bit angry that they're not getting it. And you need to hone in on that person quickly by saying, excuse me, Joan, um, how are we doing? Do, we, do I need to go over this again? Have I, have I presented it well? Notice I put it back on me, not on the student. Not, do you not understand this? Because they've heard that from their parents when they're in trouble. I've told you this a thousand times. Do you not understand this? Anybody remember hearing that phrase? So you go backwards and you say, what can I do to help you out here? Because if she's confused, I'm willing to bet there are other people who are confused. You understand it because you majored in this subject. This is simple to you. And quite <coughs> often, we're going through and going, oh boy, this is making great sense. And it would if you were in a graduate class, but your students aren't there. So take your time, use your eyes, ask them if it's okay. Jim, am I doing okay with this? You, you follow what I'm talking about? You open it up that way, they're more likely to say, I'm not sure, I'm not clear. Okay, because it's on you, not on them. On you, not on them. All right, I'm looking at the time. My only problem with doing these things, I could go on all day. <laughs> All right, this helps with clerical people even more than with faculty. Um, and I put it in there thinking there might be some clerical folks that'll show up. It's called give a name, get a name. Often, when students are upset, they get angry. They come to an office, and they're angry. And they begin their conversation with, what's the matter with you people? This school vacuums. It hoovers. That's the literary way of saying this place sucks. If you got a student that's upset and you don't know him, or you see a student in the hall who is upset, and I recommend that if you see an upset student in the hall, you stop and you ask that student what the problem is. We're going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute. What you do is you stop by getting a name, giving a, giving a name. Okay. I'm Neil, and you are pissed off. <laughs> okay, pissed. What is the problem? What will happen is, if you give them your name, you create this little community between you and the person. I've given you something very important to me, my name. And the person gives you back a name, you've got a little community going. And what happens with anger is, it builds. For anger to sustain itself, it must keep building. When you break that pattern, the anger drops. The anger drops. If you've got an angry student in, a, in after class or something, and they're just getting angry, you know their name, and you say, by the way, John, before we get going, I just want to let you know, I kind of like your t-shirt. What? Don't you notice that I'm angry? You told me about my t-shirt? Well, it is kind of a nice t-shirt. Oh, what was I talking about? You interrupt that anger with a comment. You break it. And if you give a name and get a name, hi, my name is Neil, and you are um, 
Sam? Okay, Sam, what can I try to help you with? Never say I'm going to help you or solve the problem. What can I help? What can I try <coughs> to help you with? It changes the whole perspective. You've suddenly become a person. Otherwise, you're just a cog in this machine, the machine of calm. You're just a representative of the institution they ticked off at, and you don't want that. Okay. When I was at Lansing Community College as a dean, I met this guy named Bill Shaw, uh, or as you might say, Shar. Um, Bill used to start every day by leaving his office. He'd come in, he'd look at his pink slips as to what calls he has to make, check his list from his secretary, see if there's anything he has to do, and then he immediately would leave the office. And he would go and sit down with his staff, uh, with the people that he works with. And they would all have a cup of coffee for the first 40 minutes, 30 minutes. And as he walked across campus, I noticed Bill did something interesting. He said, with a smile on his face, good morning to every student he went by. Good morning, young man. Good morning, young lady. And we'd watch these students come in like this and suddenly get good morning, and they'd go, oh, good morning. Because someone interrupted them in their oofus rage or whatever and said hello to them. I want you to say hello or at least acknowledge every student you go by. Uh, if you walk with me, I say hello to everybody. I say hello to everybody. And that includes, by the way, the maintenance people. Because they're very important. They keep this place and your offices clean. I always say hello to them. I used to bring them donuts. Nothing makes people happier than getting donuts. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it makes me happy. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do this. Oh, I, I, I forgot to mention, I, I added one thing. I started doing that with students, and I would go, good morning, how are you? How are you? Most of the time, the students just go, oh, okay, uh, fine, fine. Or they just go, uh, good, how are you? And I'd say, fine. And we'd keep on going. But sometimes the student would say, well, i got a bit of a problem. Because they'd recognize someone with a tie. And that means I'm important. If you want to look important on a college campus, the students wear a tie. Or be dressed up. You know, look like a professional. Um, how do you do that? All right, let me do this a little bit quickly. I'm going to go about two minutes over if you will deal with me. There is something in the, what I call the meet and, meet and greet zone. And it's about 30 feet <clears throat> apart. When you start walking up, you start seeing people in front of you within 30 feet. And you start noticing them. And you start checking them for weapons. <laughs> oh no, you do. It's part of the limbic brain process. You want to see if you should go to that person or not go to that person. You want to know whether you should walk right by that person or walk sort of around that person. Uh, that's just a simple reality. That person is doing the same thing with you. They want to know how they should act with you. So what you need to do is something strange, which you don't do enough. I watch people walking around campus. Swerve. They tend to walk around campus like this. Swerve. I hate it here. I wish I was somewhere else. No, you don't, but you haven't learned to show people you like being here. Mm -hmm. Smile. Talked about that earlier. I can't, I can't push hard enough to smile. You'll feel better. You'll make other people smile. Now, if you're smiling and the person comes from the decompression zone, which is where you're about 8 to 10 feet, actually, over here, and this is actually 8 to 10 feet on the, in, over here in the greeting zone, uh, the person will see you smile and will smile back. Once you get into that greeting zone, you make eye contact as best you can. If a person does not want to make eye contact with you, still say hello to them. Still say hello. 
Why don't you do it? Hi, how are you? Okay. And if they have a problem, you may not be able to solve it. If they say, I'm just doing okay, well, wait a minute, why just okay? Okay is not quite good enough. Well, I'm having a problem with one of my classes. All right, which one? Uh, having problems in um, physics. I'll pick on physics for the moment, because I had problems in physics. I didn't have good teachers, which I think you have here, which because I, I saw the way that it's done here. Oh, what's the problem? Well, I'm not understanding this. All right, tell you what. Why don't you go see Mr. Trevolino, mention to him me having a little bit of trouble with this, and I'm sure he'll give you the extra help that you need. Oh, okay. Nah, he's a jerk. <laughs> I already tried that. It didn't work. Well, that's what the students, that's what the students said to me about it. But I don't believe it. If they have a different problem, help them to the place where they can get it solved. Where they can get it solved. I'm having a personal problem with a faculty member. Uh, okay, I don't know anything about it. It's not for me to get involved. Let me bring you over to the uh, chair. Have you talked? Excuse me. Have you talked to the faculty member? First time. Uh, no, that's where you stop. Yes, I talked to him and we just don't seem to be able to get over it. Have you talked to the department chair? Uh, no. Well, that's where to stop. Whatever the solution is, help them on the way. Now, you may not solve it. It may turn out that the faculty member has a good reason for why he or she is acting in a certain way. But meet and greet is very important. Nothing kills enthusiasm than seeing the people you're going to learn from or work with frowning about being here. Because if you don't like it, I'm not going to like it. If you don't say hello to me, I don't know that that's appropriate behavior to say hello to you. Keep in mind that they think you're powerful. Teach them to do that. They will feel as if you care about them. And again, if you don't mean it, fake it. Fake it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Again, all of this boils down to the simple rule of caring about students' learning and success. Doing what's going to help them complete their course studies. That may be graduation. That may be 40, 60 credits of transfer over. That might mean a one-year certificate but whatever their goals are. And the basic way to do that, I'm going to end it up in the same way I did earlier, and you've all heard the story. Do unto students as you would have done for your mother, your father, your son, or your daughter. If you do that, you will always do the right thing. Not necessarily the thing that will make them happy, but the right thing. You know at times that when working with your son or your daughter, if you have one, or your mother or your father, which most of you have, um, you might have to tell them something that's not going to make them happy. But it's the right thing to tell them. You will always do the right thing if you use that as your guidelines. Always. Time is up. We're a little bit over. I want to be appreciative of your time as well. Any other questions, I'll be glad to take them or take them after the session up here. Or, or, I don't know if they have it here. Let me see if they put it on. They should have. No, they didn't. Um, my email is Neil R, N-E-A-L-R, which is the letter that comes between P and S, at greatservicematters.com. And if you have any questions or comments that come up during the year or after, feel free to get in touch with me. My telephone number is 413-219-6939. Feel free to use it if you have a question or a comment. And by the way, on that first day of class, you should be doing the same thing I did with your students. Giving them your school email address and telephone number to get in touch with you. All right.
because sometimes that's the way they want to do it. You can text me as well. I don't mind that. But thank you very much. I really appreciate being here, and I really appreciate your attention. I hope I helped out.